We're most accustomed to thinking about carbonyl compounds in their so-called keto form with the CO double bond, and this is true of carboxylic acid derivatives, ketones, and aldehydes. But these compounds all have an isomeric form as long as they have an alpha hydrogen in which that alpha hydrogen it has actually moved from the alpha carbon to oxygen with a shift in the double bond from CO to CC. In this isomeric form with that hydrogen in a different place and the CC double bond is known as an enol. It's called an enol because we have a carbon-carbon double bond, en, and we have an OH group, all. And in the presence of catalytic acid or base, ketones and aldehydes in particular will rapidly equilibrate to form a mixture of the keto and enol, enol forms. Now typically, as we'll see on this slide, one form is heavily favored over the other. And in most cases, most normal cases, the keto form is favored. This is typically what you're used to. Let me back up for a second and mention a point about nomenclature here. The keto and enol forms are known as tautomers. They're called tautomers because they have this particular isomeric relationship where a hydrogen, or you could think of it as a proton, has moved from one end of a pi system to the other, thinking about the enolate, the conjugate base of the enol, as a three-atom pi system. We see the difference between the keto and enol forms is which atom gets protonated, O minus or C minus in the enol. If we protonate that C minus, we get the keto form, protonate the O minus, we get the enol form. These are tautomers, and we'll see other examples of tautomers involving nitrogen later in the course. Let's talk about the relative stability question here. To this point in the course, we've only drawn carbonyl compounds in their keto forms, and this is because in the vast majority of circumstances, the keto form is more stable and more predominant than the enol form. So for something like cyclohexanone, for example, it's greater than 99.99% keto form. The enol form is there only to the tune of 0.01% or less, so massive favorability for the keto form. This is why we draw cyclohexanone in the keto form as opposed to the enol. And the thing to notice here to, to rationalize this is that the difference in terms of bond strengths and bonds made and broken is we have a CO double bond and a CH single bond in keto form and a CC double bond and an OH single bond in the enol form. And as it turns out, if you look at bond dissociation enthalpies and you think about which of these is more stable in, in those terms, thinking about a delta H for this interconversion by looking at bond dissociation enthalpies, you'll see that the CO double bond and CH single bond collectively are stronger than the CC double bond and OH single bond. And this is why most normal ketones and aldehydes favor the keto form. For aldehydes, this is a little bit less true, actually. Aldehydes tend to favor the enol form a little bit more than comparable ketones. There are two structural factors that will tend to favor the enol form. They are conjugation and aromaticity, and hydrogen bonding also comes into play, but is typically found with conjugation as well. These structural factors can shift this, this equilibrium toward the enol side, sometimes favoring the enol outright, and in many cases creating a situation where the enol is just around to a large degree. For example, the equilibrium constant might be close to one, so that the 50-50, we've got a 50-50 mixture at equilibrium. So two examples are shown here. This is acetyl acetone, acetone with an acetyl group linked to one of the methyl carbons. And here, if we look at the resulting enol after tautomerization, let me back up a little bit so we can highlight this a little bit easy, uh, more easily. We've got a conjugated system here with the new CC double bond in conjugation with the other carbonyl group. There's also a hydrogen bond here internally between the carbonyl oxygen and the OH proton. And these two structural factors conspire to actually make the enol form favored for acetyl, acetyl acetone and related beta dicarbonyl compounds. Notice this has a carbonyl group in a beta position relative to the other carbonyl group. And it's because we get a conjugated system. Actually, the enol oxygen is part of that. Here's the full conjugated system as well as an additional hydrogen bond, and that bonding interaction is stabilizing here. The other place where enols come up, and we've seen them in earlier discussions of aromatic compounds, is in phenols. The phenol contains an enol, and this is worth pausing and recognizing, right, that we've had an enol riding along with this aromatic compound all along. We've never even thought about it as a carbonyl compound, right, but now we can entertain the notion of the keto tautomer of phenol, 
and quickly realize that because that keto tautomer is non-aromatic, we've got two H's at this alpha carbon, while the enol form is aromatic, this massively favors the enol form, greater than 99.99% enol form in the case of phenol. So aromaticity can make the enol form favored as well. We've seen that structurally, the difference between the keto and enol forms is really in the position of this proton. It's linked to the alpha carbon in the keto form and the carbonyl oxygen in the enol form. And this leads naturally to questions about mechanism. How does this apparent proton movement occur? You may be tempted to simply use the carbonyl oxygen as a base, use the alpha carbon as an acid, and do something like this, shifting the proton all in one go. As those arrows fade out, I have to say, this is never how tautomerization occurs. Never, never, never is it concerted. Never, never, never is it a single step process. The basic problem with this is that would involve a four-membered transition state, right? Hydrogen, the alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and the oxygen are four atoms that would have to be arranged in a cyclic four-membered ring transition state. And that just doesn't happen very often in organic chemistry. And it's one of those things where you should really avoid it like the plague in an introductory course. Instead of that concerted one-step process, the actual mechanism of tautomerization always involves two sequential proton transfers. And the mechanism is slightly different depending on whether the reaction is catalyzed by acid or base. In the case of an acid, the first thing we're going to do is what we've done a number of times already under acid-catalyzed conditions with carbonyl compounds. We're going to protonate that carbonyl oxygen. So the acid, whatever it may be, here I've just represented it generically as HA, will protonate the carbonyl oxygen to produce a protonated carbonyl intermediate. And notice, this places the enol proton on the carbonyl oxygen. So we're sort of halfway there. What needs to happen now is deprotonation at the alpha position and just a sort of resonance type of shift of electrons to get to the neutral enol structure. And that's what happens next. The conjugate base of the acid deprotonates at the alpha position and we end up with the enol and we're back to HA showing that this is an acid catalyzed process. So here it's two proton transfers. Proton goes on the carbonyl oxygen first and proton, proton comes off the alpha carbon next. Under base catalysis, the order of events is reversed, but two proton transfers are still involved. The catalytic base deprotonates at the alpha position. We get an enolate intermediate. That enolate is to some extent basic at the carbonyl oxygen, and so now the conjugate acid of the base donates a proton to O-, minus, and we end up with the enol product. So again, it's two proton transfers, but here we're deprotonating at the alpha carbon first, and protonating at the carbonyl oxygen second, resulting in a net shift of a proton from the alpha carbon to the carbonyl oxygen. So keep this in mind, this reaction is never concerted, it's always a two-step proton transfer sort of mechanism. And this occurs very rapidly because these proton transfers are extremely rapid. So ketoenol um, tautomerization comes to equilibrium very quickly. And the reaction is referred to as tautomerization since we're interconverting tautomers. We're converting the keto form to the enol form or vice versa. And of course, the mechanisms in reverse, it's actually worth pausing the video and drawing those on your own. Try drawing a mechanism for acid catalyzed conversion of the enol form back to the keto form and base catalyzed conversion of the enol form back to the keto form. One last uh, thing I should add on here is that in the base catalyzed mechanism, we do get the base back at the end of the mechanism, right, via this proton transfer process. So this reaction is also catalytic in base. We've touched on what makes the enol more or less stable relative to the keto form. One thing we haven't talked about is the possibility of multiple isomeric enols when the two alpha carbons flanking the carbonyl group are not the same and have different substitution patterns. That's going to be our main focus. So here, for example, in 2-butanone, we have one alpha carbon is a methyl carbon, and the other alpha carbon has the carbonyl group and another carbon group connected to it. So the substitution patterns are different, right? If I deprotonated here or, or you know, generated the enol by removing a proton there, I'd get the carbon-carbon double bond here with three substituents, this methyl, this methyl, and the OH group. But if I deprotonated the methyl carbon in the course of making that enol, I'd end up with a disubstituted double bond with just the OH group and this ethyl group 
linked to the carbon-carbon double bond, and two hydrogens, of course, on the other side. And so now we have a question of which of these two enols is more stable. The good news here is you can apply your understanding of the stability of double bonds based on substitution pattern from probably earlier discussions in Organic 1 about Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule does apply to enols. The more substituted double bond is more stable. So the more substituted enol is more stable and will be the major enol formed in the presence of catalytic acid or base, for example, when this compound undergoes tautomerization. The less substituted enol is minor, and it's so minor that generally we can ignore its presence and rely on the dominance of the more substituted enol under reaction conditions where the enol reacts further. And speaking of further reactions of the enol, let's talk about how enols typically react. Although the enol is around in very small amounts, it tends to be highly reactive as a nucleophile at the alpha carbon. And so what can happen is the enol reacts, it gets consumed, and then Le Chatelier's principle kicks in, and more of the keto form converts to the enol. And so we can fully consume a carbonyl compound via conversion to the enol and reaction with something else. And the typical reaction with something else involves reaction with an electrophile, resulting in net substitution of this hydrogen for an electrophile E+. Plus. Really, substitution of this proton, H+, plus, for an electrophile E+. Plus. And so, electron flow like this is typical with the alpha carbon here acting as a nucleophile, forming a bond to E+. Plus. This leaves the carbonyl oxygen positive, as we've drawn the uh, curved arrows here, and this is the association of an electrophile to a nucleophilic pi system, in particular, the alpha carbon of this three-atom pi system built into the enol. To get to a neutral product, we can work up in base or use a base present in the reaction mixture to remove a proton from the carbonyl carbon, and notice the net result of what we've done here. We have substituted E+, plus or H plus in the original ketone in this case. This kind of reactivity is very typical of enols and enolates as well, and we'll refer to it as alpha substitution or alpha functionalization because we're replacing a pretty much unfunctionalized hydrogen with some functional group E built into the electrophile. And it's an example of electrophilic substitution. There's a deep analogy here, for example, with electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's worth going back and reviewing that mechanism and comparing it to this, which is the exact same sequence of events. Association of an electrophile to the aromatic pi system, followed by a deprotonation, which restored aromaticity.